As Sarah says, this talk is one that we'd actually do for the Wando Industrial Museum. And there is a version, a longer version of this talk on um, our YouTube channel as well. But kicking off, um, the textile industry, if you look in the middle there, you'll see calico printing and you'll see dyeing very much uh, together. Um, I'm going to whiz through this quite quickly, to be honest with you. Dying really came into to play earlier on, um, and that also involved actually bleaching calico that actually came from places like India. Uh, calico is a raw cotton that then needs to be made into, into white, um, and there was a method of doing that. Um, calico printing itself, as you can see there, late 1600s, right up until the, the 1900s. Um, in terms of calico works, um, the River Wandle from that time, there was the blue dots it actually indicate where all the calico works were along the River Wandle. And you can see the two halves there. Um, uh, right out to Croydon, where in fact, if you look, you can't even see the river there. So it shows you how far into Croydon the river was actually shown, actually um, above ground. And um, of course, uh, we'll have a quick talk and we will talk about the ones around in Merton as well. Now in terms of dyes that they actually used in the dyeing process, they were natural dyes. Uh, this is an example of some, the most famous one, the, the, the two well-known ones are indigo, which is blue, which was actually used in police uniforms as well. Um, it's also, even today, it's used in, in jeans. Um, Madder, um, was very well known uh, along the River Wandle. That gives you a natural red dye as such. And at the moment, I believe at Dean City Farm, they've actually been growing madder again to use. So that's some of the, the, the dyes that they would have actually used it to print the material later on. Um, and of course, this is, gives you an example. This is at Morrison Co. Uh, works at Merton Abbey. Um, and this is the dye vats. Uh, this is where they were mixing the colour. Now, they would have actually had a book that they would have actually used for those natural dyes. Um, now, a good example of a dye house, in fact, is the Colour House Theatre in uh, Merton Abbey, Abbey Mills. That was the dye house as such. That's where the dyes were actually mixed. And they would have had a book that actually said how much of each ingredient they actually put in to achieve a particular color as well. Now, the most famous was the red dye that was actually used in the Scarlet Hats and Robes for the Cardinals in Catholic Cardinals. Um, and there's a bit of a, a funny little story about this when we get to talk about the Huguenots, because the Huguenots were actually, they mastered the art of scarlet dyeing um, in Wandsworth. Um, and what it meant was they mastered it because when it rained and if it was rained on the cardinals with the red, it didn't actually run. So it didn't have a, the red all running down their, their faces and what have you. Um, but of course, there was a little bit of an issue with that, mm -hmm. um, which we'll cover off in a little while. Now, the calico itself, this is typical. I'm sure most of you have actually seen calico, but this is typically what it would have looked like. Unbleached, not fully processed. So bleaching was actually needed. And they had a thing called, they called Wisters. Um, the really, they started off in Holland. Um, and Holland, as you imagine, is a very flat country, a lot of water uh, and channels. Um, and bleaching, you actually have to put the cloth into a, a water channel, lift it out again, they dry off, and you do that process and you keep it going 24 seven for about two to three weeks, depending on the time of year you're actually doing it. And this is what some of the bleaching fields will look like. This is the bleaching fields for Morrison Co at Merton Abbey. And you can see the cloth laid out there, but that would have been put into channels of water where there, where there would have been ash and other ingredients that actually helped in the bleaching process. Now, in terms of dyeing and in terms of bleaching, all of this changed in around the, the 1860s. Everything was being done naturally. And, but by the 1860s, we actually started to see the introduction of um, chemical bleaching and also chemical uh, dyes as well. They were introduced. And as such, the, the, the channels that these bleaching uh, cloths were put into, they were actually turned over to watercress. And 
some of you may remember some of the previous pictures that we've seen that shows the watercrest beds at uh, Christchurch as well. Um, but once dyed, of course, it had to be washed. Um, and of course, those cloths are being washed in the River Wandle. And again, this is at Morris and Co. Big spindle that would have been spun round to actually wash the cloth and put that into, into ready for uh, fully printing. Now, really, we saw the influx and the growth of the calico industry when the Huguenots actually came along. Now, the Huguenots were actually fr French presidents. Um, they were driven out by, by the Catholic King Louis at the time. Over 200,000 Huguenots actually left France with 50,000 arriving in England. And there was probably a similar number also went to Ireland. And sometimes difficult to actually track through and um, because they changed their names, how many people actually had Huguenot uh, ancestry. Uh, but certainly they came here. They mainly went into the east end of London, um, but they slowly found their way over to the River Wandle as such. Now, of course, thinking back, what I mentioned about the cardinals um, and the Roman Catholic cardinals, remember? And of course, it was the Huguenots bringing their skills over into the late 1600s that actually did the scarlet dying. So it's quite ironic that presidents were then supplying the Catholics with the cloth. Now, in terms of printing, um, this is the kind of blocks that they use to actually start printing cloth. Um, you'll notice small pins on the end of the cloth, you have a thing called a mule as well. Um, and you use one block for each color that you actually put onto um, the material that you are actually printing. This one here is one we've got at the museum. This is a scarf block for Liberties. And this is a Liberty print works, which of course we better know now as Merton Abbey Mills. Uh, and this is a scarf block. Um, and this would have been used to print one of the, the Liberty scarves. And again, it's only one block. So this was only printing one color. Now when printing, you always worked in a team of two. You had the printer himself, which is a chap on the right hand side, you can see him applying the block to, to the material. Um, this is actually a father and son team. Um, the son is obviously on the left hand there. And what he's controlling is actually the dye that he would be using, the, what they call color, um, to print um, a particular color. So he was using that, he was controlling that, he was making sure that it was flat and he was, he was correct. And he was called a tearer. Where the name comes from, we're not sure. It may be a French French name, um, it's, but it's, it, it's one of those oddities. But certainly they would have worked in, as, as a team. And the Tira was actually at this time actually doing his apprenticeship with, with the printer. And it was quite often they would have stepped up. In the early days, these Tiras would have been 12, 13, 14 years old of, of age. It's pretty long. Now they were printing in a large room. This is again, this is Liberty Print Works uh, at Moen Abbey. This is the actual 1929 shop, as, as they call it. Um, you can see the, the heated pipe as well through the middle, but they're printing here on something like a three foot wide piece of cloth and about 30 foot long. In some cases, it could even be up to 100 feet long. And what you did, you actually print, started printing at one end. And by the time you get to the, the other end, you then finish off that color, come back and do the next color. Now, in terms of the blocks, this is typical of a block house. Now, William Morris pub um, in Merton Abbey Mills is in fact the block shop. Um, and this is where wooden blocks like this would have been kept. This is actually um, David Evans at Crayford, uh, but he would have had up somewhere around the region of 10,000 blocks in there. And each block, if you look very carefully, you can see numbers. So each block would actually, those numbers tell you what pattern they belong to. And um, so quite a job keeping those blocks, uh, not only uh, in, in order, but also keeping them repaired as well. Now, William Morris, this is one of his, this is the Cray pattern that he had. Now this used over 30 blocks. In fact, it was 34. Um, it's hard to see when you actually look at those colors, but that's a block printed pattern that William Morris had. 
Uh, when we start looking at some of the local people, you actually see here, you notice some of these people talking about fathers and sons. Um, but you've got John Flint, Calico Printer up there in cottages in the 1841 census. If you look below, you've got John Flint again, but you've also got George's son, who's also a silk printer. But make a note of where they come from, their place of birth. They were born in Ireland. So they brought their skills over from Ireland. The daughter there, or the granddaughter, she's born in Merton. Um, but also note the address, Littler's Factory. Littler's Factory was the forerunner of what we know as uh, Liberty Print Works, which obviously became Merton Abbey Mills. We also see here, with here, we've got Robert Pugh, and we've got his son, George, and they're block cutters. So they were actually making those blocks. It could take up to three months to actually make a block and do uh, and arrange that. Um, but again, you know, Fitzbridge Road, <coughs> that would have been the uh, site where we now got Wandle Villa. Uh, Wandle Villa actually itself had a calico works at the back, which was actually pulled down by uh, Hatfields when they, they or with Wandle Villa. Um, but also we then got uh, the Burling family here. You'll notice the silk printer. Um, but you also notice these two sons are both tearers. Again, notice where they, they, all of these are born at Walton Abbey. Uh, Walton Abbey, of course, Stratford, uh, as the River Lee. So leaving and moving away from the River Lee and moving over to the Wandle, which was a, being a chalk stream was a much nicer river. Uh, but again, notice uh, Merton Abbey factory, uh, which is probably re uh, applies to what we know as the Morris works. And the last one to actually look at is the colour maker. So again, you know, we've got Merton Abbey there, uh, William Pratt. Uh, he's a, a colour maker. So he was actually mixing the dyes. Again, he came from Walton Abbey. Um, his son, though John, is actually a block printer. And you'll notice that his daughter is actually the uh, Tira here. And it wasn't unusual for, for ladies uh, and young girls to actually be Tiras, though they wouldn't have lasted and gone on to being a block printer. Um, for some reason, they once they got married, they, they lost their jobs as such, but they also, um, when they reached the age of 21, that was it in terms of the industry and moving on to being a block printer as well. But you notice he's got two daughters there that are actually terrors. So a little bit of history in terms of our senses there. And, and of course, this is the Merton Abbey Mill site. And as you can see here, number four is the, is the block shop. Uh, number three is the, the 1929 shop which at the time, now it's got two levels of floor. At the, at the time it was first built, it, it was a single building. It had no second floor. Um, number eight is a long shop, which was also used for, for printing. Um, number five is, is the Colour House, and that's the Colour House Theatre. That's probably the oldest building on site. Now, all of these buildings at Merton Abbey Mills, um, possibly with the exception of the Colour House, and also uh, the wheelhouse were actually rebuilt by Liberties when they took over the site around 1912. They, they pulled down the original buildings that they had for the Littler's factory. In fact, that most of them were falling down. Um, but there was another alternative to block printing and that was copper plate printing. And that was invented by Francis Nixon and Philip S. Thompson and they introduced it from Dublin in 1752 and they brought it over to this country now probably the biggest difference was that you only could only print one color and um, so here you've got one that's printed in indigo um, and on the right hand side you've got one which is a copper plate print with printed over using blocks so it wasn't unusual to, to to have the mix and put the color in in some cases the color was actually put in by hand as well depending on the print now, there was loads of uh, disputes and there was acts of parliament to stop the sale of printed calico, to stop the import of printed calico, and mainly because of the woolen industry up north that was fearful of what was being brought in here. And obviously they wanted to safeguard themselves. 
Um, and it was also, also the cheapness of what was being produced out in India compared to uh, us here in the UK or in England in particular. Um, so nothing changes really in terms of that. But there was a number of acts in, in 1696, there was a ban on the wearing of printed calicos. 1700, there was a ban in the imported public uh, printed fabric. 1714, we had excise duties on old reused linens and calicos was lifted um, and so on. So there was a number of acts going all the way up to 1794, which was a protection of copyright. Um, William Kilburn, who was a well-known printer in the Wallington area, he had a number of his designs actually stolen by uh, an East London warehouseman taken, taken up north and they were poorly reproduced up there and resold. Um, and that was in Manchester, which of course, even today is the counterfeit capital of the UK. But the Huguenot influence can't be misread. Um, this is some work done by Eric Montagu. Um, and this is a list of people who were associated with the calico trade. Now, if you look at the first one there, it's William Asprey. Um, all of you, of course, will know Asprey and Co. Limited of New Bond Street. Um, but he actually started out as a calico printer, um, which is quite interesting, um, and built up from there. Um, we also have a number of uh, other names here. Uh, one or two I will talk about in a little while. And one of the first ones to talk about is Peter and Stephen Mulvillian. Um, I've probably spoken about these before when I've talked about the people of Merton and the river, but they've got their family tomb in St. Lawrence. They came over, they're well-known Huguenots. Uh, they had their works at Ravensbury Print Works. They also had works in Wandsworth. Um, and they introduced and they had methods that were actually far in advance of anything that would be seen at that time. And certainly they wouldn't be seen again until such time as we had the Industrial Revolution. The other one who took over that place was John Arbonot. Now, this is quite an interesting character. He actually brought uh, girls out of the Foundling Hospital to come down and work in the Calico Works. Um, he also had an operated Ravensbury farm. Now, it seems that he actually had more of an interest in growing madder than anything else, and he was more interested in the farming. He did actually end up... Um, Again, he was a Huguenot and he originated from France, but he came from France, he went back to France, and he actually ended up in Ireland, um, being head of the linen trade out in Ireland and heading up uh, that organisation out there. Now, the Reynolds family, they're not directly associated with Merton, but I, I mentioned this because they are actually uh, responsible for having the largest bleaching fields in uh, England at the time. And in fact, the Culver's estate in Hackbridge is named after them. If you know Culver's Avenue in Hackbridge, Reynolds Close or any of those places. And if you look on the map on the right hand side, you'll see where the two channels of the River Wandle actually go round, almost forming an island, which it even does to today. Um, but I had 55 acres of bleaching fields. So it gives you an idea of the amount of cloths that are actually being bleached. They weren't so great into the printing trade, so they were obviously supplying other calico works along the river. Now this gentleman, George Amian, he was responsible for bringing Francis Nixon over from Ireland and bringing over copper plate prints into this country. He actually worked for um, the East India Company. He was a director of the East India Company. He was also an MP for Dunstable. Again, he was a Huguenot. Um, he went into partnership with Nixon and, and Rucker, as I said. But he had to Huguenot descent. He was the second son of Claudius Amiens, who was a surgeon in ordinary, ordinary to George II. Um, and there's a memorial for him in All Saints Church in Carl Shortland. And it's not the big one. It's the tiny one on the right hand side that he's his memorial. Now, the other gentleman they went in with was John Anthony Rucker. Now, he was responsible for actually building um, Wandle Villa, uh, Fitzbridge Road. 
and he had his calico works behind behind it and he's always responsible for the channel we now know as Rucker's Cut um, which is which is a channel from the River Wandle and that was to serve as much as anything serve his bleaching grounds um, now he was actually quite well he actually started off we, we first find him in Carl Shorten at Strawberry Lodge he then moved here to Wandle Villa and from here he actually ended up in uh, Wandsworth in the Putney Bowling Green in Wandsworth which is a very fashionable place and eventually he built West Hill House which is now part of the Royal Hospital for Neuro Disability um, he made a lot of his wealth actually with the sound of Nixon and Co as such. Now Francis Nixon himself, as I say, he was in copper plate printing, born in Dublin, um, partnership with both Amyan and Rucker. And his tomb is in fact in St. Mary's Merton Park. Um, it's a little bit difficult to do, but you can just about make out the, the cherubs the scrolls, the fruit and the flowers that were all associated with him. And as I say, you can find his grave in St Mary's of Merton Park. Now Samuel Magpies, this is the uh, this is a guy I like to call the lovable rogue. And um, you'll also notice that he, water wheel and the chimney, which actually informs, it makes up the Wanda Industrial Museum's logo these days. Now, he was at Willow Lane in Mitcham for about 1824. Now, the works there were actually there from about 1590s. And he was, uh, had lots of disputes over water. Nothing, un nothing unusual with that. Uh, there was lots of disputes over water along the river. And um, infected other mills, so he got lots of complaints. Despite all of that, he was very successful for 25 years in there. But he ended up... Uh, moving to Figs Marsh, producing culinary herbs, um, but he ended up being finding life in the debtor's prison at the end of his, his days. Now the Littler's family, um, they were the one of the original people that were at uh, what we now know as Merton Abbey Mills. Um, they also had Bennett's, uh, Bennett's Mill, which is on the picture on the left-hand side. So they had two sites and it, it quite often gets forgotten. There was actually two calico works uh, where we know now know Merton Abbey Mills. Um, and it, and it, Bennett's, Bennett's Cut is just south of Mern Abbey Mills, it's just there. And it's, it's now, um, you've got Bennett's Courtyard and you've got all the flats there um, over that. But they actually, the Littler's family actually come from Walton Abbey and West Ham and came over to this. And there, there was certainly this migration from those areas. And um, Paisley and Art Duvaux's designs that they produced were well famous. They supplied Liberty and Co. And um, the picture is of Edmund, Edward Littler who was the uh, chemist to the works. Um, and one thing is they had 20 men constantly rich in, rinsing dyed goods. Um, but that water, that water actually contains sufficient acid, alma and other chemicals and was described by Frederick Braithwaite as being extremely foul. And of course, this is Arthur Liberty. He took over the site and he took over in, in 1904. Um, and most of the buildings we now see at Merton Abbey Mills were actually built by them. But you get an idea of what the site used to look like by looking at the, the picture at the top there. And it gives you some idea um, of what it is. The uh, picture, the lower picture was actually taken in 1986. Um, and that shows that the long shop um, before it was des destroyed or before it was changed um, and they put the individual units into it they, they have today. Um, Arthur Liberty himself, quite an in char interesting character. I, as far as I'm concerned, he's a shopkeeper. Um, never actually came up with any designs, but he was certainly an entrepreneur. Um, and he certainly knew how to get the best out of people. And he certainly knew the right goods to actually sell. And he certainly sells the best good. And anything that has a Liberty name on it these days is much sought after and does, does hold its price. And of course, we have William Morris, you know, uh, designer, poet, novelist, socialist activist, and a visionary thinker. 
member of the arts and crafts movement. He revived most of the traditional British textile uh, production. Um, and of course, he brought back into play uh, block printing as well. He actually arrived only on the Wandel from 1881. Um, and that was after he discovered the site here from his friend, along with his friend, William de Morgan, again, someone who was Huguenot descent. Um, but the calico works are here and actually lasted from 1760. But instead of doing what Liberties did and pulled buildings down, he actually maintained them. Um, and those buildings actually lasted until 1940, when a number of them were destroyed by a German bombing during the Second World War. Um, but you, there's a model of the, the works at, that he had at Merton Abbey and the Merton Abbey works at the museum that you can see. But of course, he had a lot of a famous uh, patterns. Most famous probably is the uh, strawberry thief, which is on the left hand side there. Uh, this is something he came up with after watching birds take his strawberries in his garden. I always like to think it was at Merton Abbey, but in fact, it was at Oxford in his gardens there. Uh, this is a detail of one of his other designs in the middle called the forest which is quite popular. And of course, on the right hand side is the Wandle. And um, we've already seen the Cray. Uh, and Morris produced a number of patterns from the different rivers around uh, London at the time. And that more or less brings us to the end. There are obviously a lot of other people that are involved. There's a fuller version of this talk available on our YouTube channel. Um, one little person I will mention here um, is William Kilburn. He was more or less a forerunner of Morris. And I think Morris actually probably saw his designs and, and, and championed them. Um, he was responsible uh, for illustrating a book called Flora Londinius that he did with a, a, a chap named uh, Curtis on that. But he also, he came from Ireland and he was, must have been a very lovable person. He actually bought a pony when he was walking so he could go and, and visit his parents at weekends. Um, and you also, down on the bottom right hand side, you'll see a guy named Horace Clark who's actually cutting a block at Liberties. But that brings us to an end of the uh, today's talk. If anybody's got any questions, please ask. Um, if you get any questions afterwards, please do come back to us and have a look. Uh, we'll be happy to share those with you.